1992, the Food and Drug Administration decided that genetically modified organisms were the functional equivalent of conventional foods. They arrived at this decision without testing GMOs for allergenicity, toxicity, antibiotic resistance, and functional characteristics. The aim of the seed industry is a trillion dollars of profits from royalties every year. And the aim is no farmer should have access to their own seed. The aim is every farmer should be forced into the market every year. All across our country, our people are becoming more and more conscious about the foods that they are eating and the foods that they are serving to their kids. And this is certainly true for genetically engineered foods. Americans have a right to know if their food is genetically engineered. Hello and welcome to Mad Science, the Genetic Crossroad. I am your host, Anna Kavanaugh, and I want to thank you for joining me for the broadcast tonight. In the absence of ethics. Well, that's a pretty frightening thought when we're talking about genetically modified foods and what is happening to our worldwide food supply. Where have ethics gone? Did they ever even exist? Well, that's up for debate. The GM biotech industry has used its technology to produce a variety of products using combinations of genetic material between plants, animals, and even humans, some of which cross what most of us would consider the ethical line. Well, let's talk about the history of current products and practices going on in the biotech world and how some of these seemingly innocuous creations gives us some alarming insight to the mind frame of the industry and the absolute madness of its practices. For the first time in all of history, we now have the technology to design biology, to design plants, animals, and even ourselves. Scientists have been altering the genetic material of plants and animals to achieve what is thought to be improved or creative versions of the originals. And they do this by cutting sections of DNA apart and then inserting new sections that are, in most cases, from completely different species, literally Frankensteining genes together. Huge biotech corporations like Monsanto have exploited this relatively new science to monetize and control global markets, mostly in the agriculture sector right now, but it is extending into other areas very rapidly. In fact, biotech research is now routinely genetically engineering animals and speculating to do the same with us humans. Well, this brings up a whole host of disturbing ethical issues. Are we blurring the lines between species by creating transgenic combinations? What are the long-term effects on the environment when these genetic creations are released in the field? Will transgenic interventions in humans create physical or behavioral traits that cannot be distinguished from what is usually perceived to be human? Or what about the blending of non-human animal and human DNA, resulting in offspring that have degrees of intelligence or behaviors never before seen? Should these new entities be given rights and special protections? And finally, who has the right to decide how these technologies will be used and implemented? Biotech corporations have been promoting the idea that genetically modified products are completely safe, just like nature made it. They've told us that credible and sufficient research has been done that backs up all of their claims, and that the way forward in facing the world's hunger issues or the fight against disease is to control our genetic design control it, to change it. They promise benefits and improvement to human life through identifying and preempting the genetic cause of certain diseases, or by changing plant genes in such a way that they now contain medicinal or added nutritional properties when we consume them. But how far will they go? There seems to be a breakdown in the ethics of biotech engineering practices as we rush full speed ahead with open arms into this uncertain science. But one thing is sure, And that's that these matters are rarely simple and straightforward. They usually have unexpected outcomes. And so seemingly positive results in the short run are no guarantee for the future. And who? Who is making the call on these issues? After all, it's really not that many people who seem to be inexplicably in charge of these things and who are making some pretty enormous and potentially catastrophically dangerous decisions for all of us. Do they possess any kind of ethical or moral code? Is it, since now we have matches, we have a right to burn the house down? I want to talk about the disturbing absence of ethics seemingly rampant in the biotech industry, 
creating a terrifying bull in the china shop or kid in the candy store effect inside these chemical corporations who are playing with our food and busy patenting life and altering it. Now, please bear with me for a minute or two, and let's talk about this. Let's really talk about this. What would it be like in a future world where your life started with your parents designing your genes? Besides screening for unwanted genetic diseases, they might select your sex, height, and hair color. And who knows, depending on the current social fads of the day, they may also choose genes whose overall functions are not clearly understood but are thought to be connected with personality, intelligence, thoughtfulness, or perhaps even sexual orientation. You might even be genetically engineered to be an enhanced clone of one of your parents, or perhaps of a celebrity whose genetic data your parents have purchased at a great price. And if your parents are poor, they may be paid to design you with genes tailored for a particular occupation, together with a pre-birth contract for future employment. And with this, it follows that you'd probably belong to a clearly defined social class according to the degree of your genetic enhancement. This is the ultimate in eugenic control. Now, in this new world, all of the food that goes into your body is completely genetically engineered. The natural world is entirely made over, invaded, replaced, and distorted beyond recognition by genetically engineered plants, trees, animals, insects, bacteria, and viruses, some intentional and others that are out of control. Now, illnesses are very different, too. Most of the old ones are gone or mutated into new forms. What were once genetically engineered remedies have now become unstoppable afflictions. And what's more, we ironically attempt to genetically engineer our way out of the problems, which only results with digging ourselves in deeper. Okay, well, that all paints a pretty scary picture of the future, doesn't it? And it may sound like a science fiction world, one that's much different from the real world we live in today. And we might be inclined to write it off as scare tactics or biopunk storytelling, but the technology to do these things already exists and has actually been around for years. And we may be surprised to know that we're closer than we think to seeing a reality like this play out in our lifetimes. For example, we already know about the pervasive application of genetically modified crops into our food supply. And that currently about 80% of all foods in the grocery store, including meats, fruits, vegetables, and processed foods, are genetically modified. Not to mention GM items like trees and cotton. And the list is growing. The thing is, once genetically engineered products are introduced and commercialized, they cannot be recalled. They are here for good. So if an unforeseen catastrophe strikes, as it has with the honeybee populations in colony collapse disorder, or cases with superweeds, or a new strain of a lethal virus, we cannot simply undo the problem and reset back to the start. And biotech companies, they know this, yet they push forward, taking advantage of loopholes and deregulation, using money and clout to invent and commercialize new GM crops. Now again, what is so very difficult to take in with all of this, though, is that it is a relatively small group of people who are at the root of all of this. They are responsible for moving us all in this direction. Who are they to make these decisions with a shoot-first, ask-questions-later attitude, despite reasonable and important arguments to the contrary? As far back as 1976, George Wald, a Nobel Prize-winning biologist and Harvard professor, wrote, quote, Genetic engineering faces our society with problems unprecedented not only in the history of science, but of life on the earth. It places in human hands the capacity to redesign living organisms, the products of some three billion years of evolution. It presents probably the largest ethical problem that science has ever had to face. Our morality up to now has been to go ahead without restriction to learn all that we can about nature. Restructuring nature was not part of the bargain. For going ahead in this direction may be not only unwise, but dangerous. Potentially, it could breed new animal and plant diseases, new sources of cancer, and novel epidemics. End quote. Spoken over 30 years ago, Professor Wald's words resonate true today. Restructuring nature was not part of the bargain. Yet biotech corporations are restructuring nature at an accelerated pace, and their reckless practices indeed present one of the largest ethical problems science has ever had to face. Who are they to redesign nature, and to do it without the consent of the rest of us? We are now entering an era where biotech not only continues to gain control, but somehow becomes the accepted standard. 
In the absence of ethics, these are the kinds of things that happen. As a matter of fact, a new extension and focus in the biotech industry is the genetic modification of animals and even humans. For example, recent advancements have made it possible to scan every chromosome in a single human embryonic cell, allowing a computer microchip to process and map over 1,500 genetic traits at once, including heart disease, obesity, athletic ability, hair and eye color, and genes linked to intelligence. And this is being sold to the public as a way to preempt disease and other health defects by peering into the genetic code of an unborn child and manipulating their DNA, intervening with a natural process. That is utterly frightening. It is so scary. On the surface, it sounds great, wonderful. Look what we can do. But we would be so incredibly foolish and lack such foresight to not really look at what is underlying Who's to say that these human imperfections and challenges aren't meant to be in the first place? But in the bigger picture, it doesn't just stop with preventing inherited diseases. This technology allows parents to design an unborn child to have desirable traits, a concept that has been dubbed creating designer babies. So now we're in the position of being creator. So going back to what I mentioned before, this means that parents who have the money can pick and choose traits that they want for their children. Traits that have nothing to do with disease prevention and everything to do with social or physical enhancement. Is this the fair thing to do? But the bigger question is how does this interfere? How does this alter our evolutionary process? It opens a whole category of ethical issues which need to be addressed. Where is the line between genetic treatment to avoid disease and genetic enhancement? And where is the line between creation and creator? And should we be crossing it? You know, if people were allowed to purchase made-to-order children, think about how that would change our world. The breakdown, profound breakdown, of social divisions that would occur. It would be unlike anything we've ever seen. It's important to know that this technology exists, but it still may be several years before actually being implemented. However, a more eminent version of the idea of genetic treatments and enhancements is something called farming, with a PH, farming, and it's going on right now. This is on the verge of being commercialized by Monsanto and others, and refers to the use of genetic engineering to insert genes that code for pharmaceuticals into host animals or plants that would otherwise not express those genes, essentially transforming crops into pharmacies. That's right. Imagine a crop of corn or wheat that by consuming it gives the same effect as medication from a pharmacy. If this technology is commercialized, think of what might happen. Drugs of different sorts for different applications would be grown and mixed in with certain foods, perhaps to make taking medication a more pleasant experience. The bigger problem is, since GM crops are known for contaminating neighboring crops, what happens when a pharmaceutical drug intended for one crop gets accidentally mixed into another? This is bound to happen. Unsuspecting consumers could be ingesting a drug that causes a fatal reaction. This is not so far-fetched, and it's very frightening. And let's not forget that altering genes to achieve a desired effect, or drug in this case, may induce other unforeseen effects that could be much more hazardous than what it was intended to cure in the first place. This technology could also be used to craft a more sinister purpose by genetically altering crops to target certain medical conditions or enhanced nutrition they could also be used as a poison. Think about this. In the wrong hands, only a small modification to the GM process could work to produce a toxin that targets our central nervous system, for example. Maybe used to target a specific ethnic group. Just consider the eugenics laws in a number of Western countries, including some parts of the United States around the turn of the 20th century. Thousands of people who were developmentally disabled, mentally ill, convicted of crimes, or otherwise classified as unfit, were forcibly sterilized. In the late 1930s and early 1940s, Nazi Germany took it to another level by not only sterilizing, but killing those deemed undesirable, an entire ethnic group. The point here is, in the wrong hands, this technology could be used in our food supply as a weapon or a means of mass control. It can be used as an option to genetically change people into something different from being human. 
We could be opening the door to a new eugenic era that might spell the end of the human species altogether. Think about it. Using genetic engineering as a means of ethnic cleansing or creating race or genetically superior people competing for the same resources as normal people. Could the human species become obsolete? Would we become a new species altogether? Where would it end? And do we have any idea, really, what we are doing when we are handling this technology for profit? You know, we see similar storylines like this in movies all the time, such as Gattaca and The Island, or in any number of science fiction novels. But it's important that we keep things in perspective. Someone has to. What I'm talking about is not science fiction. What the biotech industry is doing is not science fiction. These technologies exist right now and are poised to be commercialized. We are on a train that has already left the depot. We didn't ask to be on it, but we are. And it's not a matter of if similar things like what I'm talking about will happen. It's more depending on the track we take, when they will. And for example, cloning, which by definition is the process of making an exact genetic copy of an individual. And that's been around for a while. The first adult animal ever cloned was Dolly the sheep in 1997. At the time, this was seen as a remarkable technological feat, because until then, clones never survived. And in the decade that followed, other animals were cloned in research laboratories around the world. But because the technology was still being developed, success rates were low. But in recent years, the techniques have improved to the point that it's becoming economically feasible to clone animals for commercial production. In fact, the FDA decided in January of 2008 that meat and milk from cloned animals like cattle, pigs, and goats are substantially equivalent, there's that term again, to their non-cloned counterparts. So biotech companies now have the green light to use cloning methods. They have a free license to commercialize this technology. The FDA also does not require labeling of cloned material, so it is difficult to know how much has actually found its way into our food supply. Now, cloning is still a very expensive process, though, so it will likely take a few more years before we really see cloned food products in greater quantities in the grocery store. But the point is that we're already there. The FDA approved the cloning of animals years ago. It is an acceptable practice, and they do not have to tell us about it. Do you see where I'm going here? These biotechnologies are becoming accepted as the norm more and more every day. And let's talk about some of the other applications of cloned animals. For example, a Texas company called Crestview Genetics is now in the business of cloning polo ponies. Polo is a big sport in many countries, and good polo horses are in great demand. In 2010, a three-month-old clone of a polo pony sold for $800,000 in Argentina. Crestview expects to create up to 30 clones of valuable polo horses each year. So you do the math. Cloning animals for a profit is likely to become even more commonplace within the next decade. The most likely candidates are animals that are worth a lot to somebody, like prize-winning bulls for breeding cattle, championship dogs, rare or endangered animals, and even beloved pets. How much would you be willing to pay to have your pet cloned? In 2002, they successfully cloned the first cat named Cece, and in 2005, a dog named Snubby. Now, I can identify with this. I'd love to bring back a pet. I miss my little Rudy terribly. But I have to stop and question my motivation for wanting something like that. I don't want it. I don't think it's morally right. By cloning a pet, aren't we interrupting the cycle of life? Aren't we interrupting what is part of the experience of life, sad as it may be? Death? Another thing to consider is that although we may expect our cloned pet to be just like the original they won't necessarily have the same outward gene expressions. And that is what is so important to remember here. Even now, researchers continue to find abnormalities when they clone organisms. The clone may be born normal and resemble their original counterpart, but the majority of the time they'll show the changes in their gene expressions happen later on in life. So there may be changes not only in appearance, but in psychological and personality attributes as well. The theory behind this is that even though the biological blueprint is the same in cloned animals as in the natural ones, they are read and expressed differently. 
But despite these challenges and obvious ethical issues, scientists are considering the possibilities of bringing back extinct species. For now, only one attempt has been made. It was a large goat-like animal that lived in the cliffs of the Pyrenees Mountains between Spain and France, and it officially went extinct in 1999. In 2003, scientists were able to create a baby clone, but it lived for only a few minutes. Now, just last month, scientists are speculating about bringing back the woolly mammoth. You know, the huge, hairy, elephant-like creature that went extinct some five to ten thousand years ago. They plan to achieve this by reconstructing a partial DNA sample from a baby mammoth found in the frozen grounds of Siberia, and then implant this into an elephant mother. I find this absolutely outrageous. Look, I could not be a bigger animal lover and champion for the protection of animals. But I also trust in the natural process going on around us. Animals from the past may be better left in the past. If they went extinct, it was probably for a reason. If their plans are successful, think of the potential torment such a creature would be in, not to mention the setting of a precedent for similar projects. Although it's claimed that a real-life Jurassic Park is not possible due to the lack of genetic material available, can we be confident that it won't become possible at some time in the near future? Biotechnology is messing around with fire, like children playing with matches. And for the sake of scientific curiosity, the cornerstone and primary focus of biotechnology is the manipulation of DNA in living organisms and then to use this to produce bioproducts that are sold by corporations. This is what they're doing. They're doing it every day, and they seem to be doing it in any and every way that they can. When it comes to developing products for commercial use, the goal is always to increase sales and increase profits for shareholders. In a world with decreasing resources where many people go hungry, is spending research dollars to develop GM fluorescent fish or glow-in-the-dark pets an acceptable thing or is it not? For all of the advantages and positive claims about genetic engineering, where are its long-term benefits? All we seem to be seeing are its long-term risks. What is the price for following down this path? Well, we need look no further than the lack of concern and blatant disregard for public health by this biotech industry and the failure of the protective agencies put in place to keep us safe. They show us that the price is far too high to pay. In order to ensure profits for mega biotech corporations in the years to come, we're putting the biosphere up for sale. We're compromising life on the planet and even risking the loss of the signature of humanity. Genetic engineering poses serious long-term risks to human health and to the environment and to our evolutionary process. It raises serious ethical questions about the right of a few human beings to completely alter life on the planet, to become creationist, play God, if you will, for the curiosity and benefit of a few. In the absence of ethics, what do we have left? The train has already left the depot, and we are all on it, and we didn't know we were. But now we do. And because we do, we as consumers now have two very important things. First, a responsibility to ourselves, our families, and our fellow human beings to become informed, to speak up and speak out about what is happening, to no longer go blindly wherever it is the biotech industry wants to lead us, to let the FDA and our president know that we will not be a party to the poisoning of mankind. And the second very important thing, maybe even more important than the first, now that we know we have a choice. We can choose not to buy products containing GMO. We have a choice. So now we'll move on to a special segment of the program called The Listener's Voice, which is where folks out there have kindly taken the time to write into the website with their questions and comments. And to close each show of the program, I'll get through as many as I can. And we'll start with Adam. Adam Sabatka, I hope I get that right, uh, writes into the show and says, Hello, Anna Kavanaugh. I've just found this show and I'm liking it. I can't listen at your show time because I'm working swing shift, but I do get to stream it when I'm riding the bus. So here's my question. 
My younger brother has asthma pretty bad. He always has, but after hearing more about GMO stuff, I wondered if it was related somehow to my brother's problem. It gets pretty bad sometimes for him. Sometimes we have to take him to the hospital. It's like he can't breathe and we get very worried. But I wonder if there's something we could do for him, like keep him away from these GMOs. I guess I'm trying to figure out if this genetic modified food thing is causing some of it. Well, hi, Erin. Thanks so much for your kind words about the show. I'm really glad that you're enjoying it and that you're tuning in when you can. Uh, And I also want to thank you for writing in with your comments and concerns for your little brother. Um, Well, to begin with, research over the past few years has shown that the rate of asthma is increasing in this country, and especially, sadly, among children. Uh, You didn't mention how old your, your brother is. But they say that some of the reasons behind this spike in asthma could be due to a general increase in air pollution or other stresses. Uh, I don't know if you happen to live in an area with with more pollution. Um, But they also say that this increase may be due to genetically modified organisms. So to answer your question, yes, your brother's problem could be GMO related or at least triggered by GMO. Uh, I don't know if keeping him away from eating it will solve the problem for him, though. That's best left to his doctor. Um, But there are a couple of things you could try, and and you've probably already heard about them. But one thing that helps uh, with asthma is coffee. Uh, In fact, it's one of the best known foods for controlling how bad an attack is because it contains caffeine, um, which helps to open up those air passageways. Another thing I've heard is that low levels of vitamin D can cause more severe attacks. So eating mushrooms or sunflower seeds just might help. Uh, And just so you know, mushrooms themselves aren't GMO. But foods containing them, like cream of mushroom, are very likely to have it. Um, I'd make sure to go get it checked out with a doctor before experimenting uh, with anything too much first. And if you can keep them away from GMO and kind of give that a trial run, you just might find uh, that his symptoms decrease and that he's uh, feeling generally better anyway. Um, It never hurts to try. Um, So I hope that answers your question. And uh, thanks again for writing into the show. Okay. And up next, Tamara, or Tamara Bedford, writes into the show and says, Hi, you've talked a bit in your previous shows how GMO foods contribute to allergies in people and pets. I myself have suffered allergies for years and take Zyrtec to help with it. Although it seems to work all right, I now feel that I've become dependent on it. So my question is, does Monsanto have anything to do with the Zyrtec brand or any other allergy remedy medicine? It would sure figure if they did, and I would also be very upset. Is Zyrtec containing GMOs? Please tell me the good or bad news. I really need to know. Well, hi, Tamara. Very good questions. Listen, Zyrtec is made by a company called McNeil Consumer Healthcare, which is a subsidiary of Johnson & Johnson. As far as the record shows, there isn't a connection between Monsanto and Johnson & Johnson that way. Monsanto isn't making profits uh, off of Zyrtec. Um, There also is no connection with Benadryl or Claritin. As far as containing GMOs, it appears that these medications do not, but make sure you look at the ingredients list because there may be a form that does. For instance, if the label says it contains soy, put it back on the shelf and back away slowly, or, or maybe as fast as you can, I should say. Uh, You know, as we know, 90% of all soy in the world contains GMO. Um, But thank you for your comments. Uh, It would be really worth uh, our while to keep an eye on this. Company mergers and acquisitions happen all the time. I wouldn't be at all surprised to find out that Monsanto is now making profit off of the allergy-causing agents as well as the allergy remedy medicine. You know, that's just right up their alley. But um, anyway, I hope that answers your question. Thanks so much for writing into the show. Take care. And up next, we have Carl Rolston. Uh, She writes into the show and says, I have just a quick question and feel kind of stupid for asking, but do some foods have more GMO in them than others? Is there some kind of GMO scale? Hi, Carla. I don't think that is a stupid question at all. In fact, I'm delighted that you asked it. Uh, I have not heard of a GMO scale per se, but depending on the percentage of soy, corn, sugar beet, or canola oil, uh, etc., you know, that you see on the label, that should give you an idea of the GMO content. Um, you know, 
obviously some foods will contain more GMO than others because one may, uh, you know, have, uh, you know, say more corn syrup than another food would. Um, you know, remember that genetically modified organisms are not some kind of white powder that they add separately to foods. Um, you know, it's not something that's going to be in a tablespoon versus a, a cup or a half a cup, uh, like they, they would with MSG or something like that. So you can't really say there's a tablespoon of GMO in your food. But if we are mindful of which food sources that GMO is found, that's a start. And that's where we can begin making those choices to steer clear. Thanks for writing into the show. And one more. Jean Weiss writes in and says, you're doing such a good service by bringing us this show every week. Thank you so much. I have a question. Me and my husband were talking about what has been happening in the GMO industry in this country. And I thought, where could we go to escape it? If we wanted to move anywhere in the world, where could we go to avoid eating GMO foods completely? Is there such a place? Just wondering. Hi, Jean. Thanks so much for your kind comments. Hmm. Where could a person go to be completely free from GMO? Uh, Well, in this day and age, it might be pretty hard to do. There are several countries around the world that prohibit the cultivation and import of GM foods. A couple of the bigger ones are France and Italy. Uh, France in particular has pushed back pretty hard on the GMO phenomenon. So if I had to give you a single answer, I think I'd have to say move to France. Um, You know, there are lots of countries who do allow GMOs, but they also have mandatory labeling laws to inform people which foods contain it unlike the United States, unfortunately. Uh, You know, to date, the U.S. is one of the only countries that still refuses to label GM products, despite the overwhelming consensus of American consumers. You know, we could really take a lesson from France when it comes to GMO. So best of luck to you if you ever decide to move abroad to escape GMOs. And uh, thanks so much for taking your time to write into the show. Take care. And with that, I've run out of time in this segment. If you would like your question or comment to be featured on the show, I would love to hear from you. Just pay a visit to the website at www.geneticcrossroadradio.com and follow the link to the listener's voice. Once there, just go ahead and fill in the form and send me along your thoughts. I will feature as many as I can during each broadcast. Your voice, it really does matter and will help make a difference in both the future of our food and our human health. This show is a conversation and that's where all change begins. So let's get talking. I also want to tell you about the Facebook page for the series. If you're enjoying the show and would like to participate in some more interactive communication, I'd love for you to come give a like and join it at www.facebook.com slash Anna Kavanaugh Mad Science Genetic Crossroad. And I hope to see you there. Thank you for listening to Mad Science, The Genetic Crossroad. Please join me every Tuesday for more on GMO. On next week's show, that's Tuesday, April 23rd, we'll continue our conversation with an episode named GMO, What You Need to Know. What are the latest happenings in the GMO industry? There's a lot going on. The show will examine the current state of GMO in the U.S. and around the world, from the newest wave of biotechnology and food crops to the steps of Congress. Has our food industry hit new lows, or has Monsanto hit new highs? Looking at trends of today, are we able to see what is just around the corner in the near future? I hope you'll join me for next week's broadcast. If we destroy nature, surely nature will destroy us. For while we may hold dominion over nature, we do not possess its wisdom. Until next time, be well, be healthy, and be informed.